My name is John Ellison. I'm one of the founders and managing directors at Richmond Quantitative Advisors, or RQA. Uh, we basically are quant guys. We use a lot of data. We use a lot of programming to inform our strategies, our portfolio decisions, and we deploy them through a, a variety of different methods. We do a lot of managed portfolio um, solutions, essentially kind of like an OCIO type uh, service. We manage a number of UMAs and SMAs. We have a private fund, and we also work with groups on um, proprietary research and development. Um, we, we kind of understand that all of our ideas are not necessarily everybody else's ideas, and we are more than happy to kind of lever our expertise to help other folks kind of ferret out what, um, what they want to work through. Today I'm here to talk about, um, I mean, really the, the punchline is this is sort of my, my waging war on passive investing. Um, I think as CFAs, this is kind of the, the bane of our existence. It's kind of become common knowledge to too many people that um, if you just dump money in the S&P or the 6040, you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to research what you're actually investing in. Just set it and forget it, and you'll be fine. Um, I studied for multiple years to uh, sort of combat against that, and now that's what my firm is <clears throat> out there trying to do, and that's what I'm going to share some knowledge on, on today. But really, here are some of the things that we have found to be evidence-based ways to really improve client portfolios. Now, the way that you normally think of improving a long-term or improving a client portfolio, so you think of it in terms of like absolute terms. You know, we want returns that meet or exceed our target or our client's target. We want to do it in a way that we can stick with. We want low volatility. We want a lot of consistency, stability. Um, Kind of goes back to the late Charlie Munger, said the first rule of compounding, never interrupt it unnecessarily. As we all probably know, you know, when, when the going gets really, really tough, people tend to bail out um, at the you know, least opportune time. So try to get the highest returns you can, but do it in a way that you're going to stick with it. So we need to make our portfolios robust, anti-fragile, um, and... In our line of thinking, you want to use time-tested methods. Um, you really gain confidence in what you're doing through evidence. That's why we're, we're data-driven, quantitative kind of guys. So that's all great, and there's a lot of things I'm going to talk about in this presentation that it's not a whole lot of new things. It's a lot of evidence-based concepts like diversification and factor tilts and using things like value and quality and momentum. Um, but there's mainly a dual mandate here. So there are also some short-term goals that we have as advisors and managers as well. And that's keeping clients happy and not getting fired. And how do you not get fired? Well, first and foremost, you can get fired by losing your clients a lot of money or having big drawdowns. But <clears throat> the one that we've all kind of probably seen over the years and become familiar with is another risk, which is more of a short-term risk, is meaningfully underperforming some benchmark, having some adverse tracking error that persists over a long period of time. And this effectively creates somewhat of a dual mandate. So if you invest in like the 60-40, let's say you go completely passive, you're going to hug the benchmark. And the global 60-40 has lots of fairly nasty drawdowns. You know, you're likely going to experience something that's 25, 30% or more on the downside from your latest high in nearly every decade. And a lot of clients say that they can stick with this, but whenever the 60-40 is down 35%, the headlines are not everything's fine. It's layoffs, it's bank failures, it's bankruptcies, it's literally blood in the street. Um, and people do not want to stick with that plan when that's sort of streaming across their, you know, their iPad. 
So we can combat this with some of the things I'll talk about today, but this sort of leads into the problem on the second part of the dual mandate, which is tracking error. So what I've got here is a relative outperformance chart. So equity factors, what I mean by that are, it's an equal weight portfolio of large cap value, large cap momentum, and large cap quality versus the S&P 500. Now, as you can see, the equity factors tend to outperform. This goes back to the 70s fairly meaningfully from bottom left to top right. But the red boxed areas are areas where this kind of portfolio, this more logical sound investing fails. It doesn't look too bad, but if you really look, dig into it, we're looking at five, six, seven year periods where your, you know, evidence-based portfolio didn't outperform the S&P. And then it happens again and again and again. And hence, you fail the second part of the dual mandate. So in some of our research, we've dug into what large endowments do, and they've kind of figured out um, some fairly interesting ways to combat both of these problems. This is data out of uh, the National Association of College and University Business Officers, or NACUBO. The, the extent of the data is back through 1998. This is an annual chart, so it's a little sort of elementary looking. But large endowments have outperformed a global 60-40, that's an ag by almost 400 basis points a year since 1998. To put this in context, the S&P 500's return over the same period was around 8.4%. So putting up numbers right around what the S&P was doing, but with 60-40-like volatility and 60-40-like drawdowns. And drawdowns, what I mean there are, you know, you reach a peak, and what is your subsequent percentage decline um, at that maximum point before returning back up to, a, to another peak? Not to mention they, they outperformed the 60-40 in about, I think it was 83 or 85% of the years. So there was a lot of consistency there as well. So how do they do this? And this is sort of the, the blueprint for what we're going to walk through today. So, of course, they, they sort of start off with global beta, stocks and bonds. But then they layer in things that enhance their risk management and enhance their expected returns. Um, we're gonna kind of walk through these one by one. One thing that they do very well is they take diversification extremely seriously. Um, and to put that in context, this is also from the Nakubo data, and it shows their average um, asset allocation over this period. Now, the thing that's notable to us is you have a very sizable chunk in alternatives and you know, things like real assets and commodities that most people, I think, would label as alternatives. Um, private equity and venture is not included in these buckets, even though many folks will label those as alternatives. But to focus on the more differentiated, you know, uh, structurally non-equity, non-bond um, components, we're looking at over 40% of portfolio is allocated to something that's completely different than the traditional stock bond. So why do they do this? Correlations matter a lot. So if you look at global equities, I've got REITs in here, but basically this is the category where if it's a volatile asset and it's mainly going up and down based on expectations around growth, whether growth is going up or growth is going down, they tend to ebb and flow together. Also, as we've seen throughout history, whenever the going gets really rough, the correlations in this bucket go basically to one. That's why we layer in bonds. Bonds tend to be over long periods of time uncorrelated, um, especially in times of stress. You have this flight to quality. The Fed lowers interest rates, so when stocks are going down, you tend to see things like treasuries start to go up. Act as a nice sort of counterbalance, this is nothing new. But then we get into what we call true diversifiers. 
And just for context, the more red something gets, the more highly correlated. And the more green something gets, the, the lower the correlation. So things like commodities, gold. I use trend in here as sort of the hedge fund catch-all, mainly because they can go long, they can go short, they trade global assets, and they have a long history of available data for us to you know, take a look at and use, whereas other strategies don't have as long a history, particularly back through the 1970s. So why is correlation important? So here's the math behind correlation. So what this shows here on the x-axis is the number of assets that you have in the portfolio. And on the y-axis is how much volatility are you able to diversify away from the portfolio um, based on the number of assets you have and the correlation amongst one another that those assets have with each other. So if you have a portfolio of 10 assets that are all 75% correlated with one another, mathematically, the best you can do is strip away 12% of your volatility, mathematically. If you have 50% correlated assets, now you're looking at around a quarter. So diversify away 25%, 26%. As we walk along, 25% correlation, we're getting getting somewhere, now we're talking 40% reduction, 0% correlation, you're able to strip away mathematically upwards of 70% of your portfolio volatility. Um, this is why correlation means so much, um, even in our opinion above things like sharp ratio. Um, you, you can add something that is fairly low sharp but uncorrelated and have a much more dramatic effect on the the um, stability and the performance of the portfolio than adding in another highly correlated manager that just has a, you know, a much higher sharp ratio. Yeah. When you think about zero percent correlation or negative, like how does that actually work when you put the uh, math together, right? <laughs> it's like there's nothing but zero. It's like you've got a hundred and minus one hundred or whatever. Just curious. And, and correlations evolve over time. Yeah. yeah. So um, you, you have to track it. And one, one of the best things that you can do too is, you know, we diversify based on structural abilities or structural natures of assets. So what is this payoff structure based on? And you want to find things that have very different structural return streams. I was just, maybe my question also too is like, it is that, but that's where you, when I say assets, you start having to go into the realm of kind of creating your own return streams. Um, and that's what a lot of like these highly diversified quantitative managers are doing is they are creating their own uncorrelated equity curves by trading relationships like statistical arbitrage and things like that. So, no, in the world of traditional assets, once you get kind of beyond the ones I listed on the uh, correlation matrices, you're you're kind of spent, and then it's yeah. You, then you got to go out and find find new things. Yeah, just looking at those charts, like if you put all those five together. The the trick the trick is finding ten plus uncorrelated, truly uncorrelated return streams, and that's therein lies the rub. Um, but to put this in concept, context, we like to run Monte Carlos. It helps us give a better, get a better assessment of what the actual true statistical distribution of a return stream or asset is likely to be. Um, this is using, back through 1972, data on the MSCI ACWI. Um, we use a little bit different of a Monte Carlo process. It's more conservative. It's called a block bootstrap. I don't need to for you guys with that, but essentially it captures um, the more unique moments, uh, like 2008 and 9, COVID, dot com, you know, long periods in like the 1970s of rampant inflation, whereas other traditional Monte Carlos, um, they, they miss those really, really extended tales. A, a traditional Monte Carlo is not going to show you a 13 standard deviation event, whereas a block bootstrap is, is going to. Um, 
So effectively, if we only allocated to U.S. or global stocks, this is the kind of spread of outcomes we're looking at. Why do we layer in bonds? It tightens up our realm of expectations. And then why do we add in diversifiers? I basically threw in 30% into the alts bucket. It's 10% CTA, 10% gold, 10% commodities. And it essentially just tightens our range of expectations and it's mainly stemming from that, the nature of the correlation amongst those assets. Another way to look at this is in terms of the compound annual growth rate. So this bell curve that you're looking at right here is basically another representation of this, just in terms of annualized return. Uh, but what we see here is about 18% of the distribution fails to outperform a 30-year treasury rate of around 4%. About 79% that's right down the fairway, you know, probably what we'd mostly expect out of a 30-year um, allocation to global stocks. And with 3% that we kind of throw into that sort of grand slam kind of area where it's, you know, there is that real potential for real compounding just kind of out there in the right-hand tail. You know, we layer in bonds, um, go to more of our traditional 60-40, what we see is this orange curve. We get a much tighter distribution, many more down the fairway. We tighten up our left-hand side of the tail, 91% are right there in the meat. But we lose some of the, the potential upside, which intuitively makes sense. When we layer in the alternative side, we see this tightening up of the left-hand tail at almost zero. It, it actually is zero. There's just a smoothing effect with the graph here. 99% are right down where we would hope the expectations would land. And, you know, we, we've got sort of the 1% the out there, but, which we, if we got lucky. So if you actually back test in like the, this portfolio back through the 70s, the green line, looks like the line that I would choose. It's better in terms of absolute annualized return, has 20% less volatility, third less on the max drawdown side. So back to our dual mandate, does a very good job of, of outperforming the benchmark. Herein lies the rub. You're gonna look different. And when you look different for extended periods of time, and these are not small periods of time. These are 10 years. I mean, the, the latest is, you know, 13, 14 years. Um, so even though it's the statistically better portfolio, this is one of the reasons why so many advisors out there hate alternatives is because you end up with these massive periods of time with material tracking error and clients can't stick with it. If you underperform the, the passive 60-40 for too many years in a row, you're, you're getting fired, to put it bluntly. So are there ways that we can actually fix this? Factor tilts. This is what a lot of stuff we learn about in the CFA program. Um, we take a much deeper dive. This is a very high level view, but based on like the Eugene Fama <clears throat> and Ken French research, value <clears throat> by value decile. So effectively, what this is showing is if you buy stuff that's on the right-hand side with higher earnings per price, higher earnings per share, per price per share, over long periods of time, you tend to do notably better than if you bought things that were at low earnings relative to their, their share price. You know, fairly intuitive. Momentum. Things that are going up tend to keep going up, and things that are going down tend to keep going down relatively. Quality, there's a lot of different definitions of this. The Fama French data points out, they, they, they label it as operating profitability. It's basically operating profit divided by book equity. There's some issues with that, but that's what they use. But in essence, when you buy more profitable companies and hold them over the long haul, as opposed to less profitable companies, it's fairly intuitive 
and the data shows that you outperform um, doing the opposite. And if you had you know, adhered to these methodologies over long, long periods of time, back through the 70s, you would have outperformed the S&P 500 benchmark by 200 to 300 basis points annually with about the same level of volatility and the same amount of maximum drawdown, so higher sharp ratio. So can we use these sort of evidence-based methods to layer into the portfolio? We can. And if we replace a portion of our you know, global stock portfolio with more factor-oriented approaches, so take 15% from global stocks, allocate it to 15% factors, you get this nice shift of our relatively tight distribution from left to right. Dual mandate check. As we expect, you know, basically we maintain similar level of volatility from our prior um, iteration, about the same side on the downside, but our, our annualized returns would have, would have improved. Problem is, we're still dealing with the tracking error, um, the, the pesky, pesky old tracking error. So it's a little bit better. Um, the outperformance is more meaningful. You may have bought yourself a lot of brownie points along the way, but especially since the bottom in 2009, um, it, this, this has sort of been where the, the massive period where passive has just made any kind of active decisions look not so wise. So this is more of a dynamic positioning is, is tricky and I'll, I'll walk through it, but it's kind of a shameless plug for a lot of the stuff that we do. Um, but the way that we view it and a lot of endowments view it and whether they outsource it or they do it internally is they know that markets evolve. So why should our portfolios not evolve? So if you look at rolling, this is actually a smooth three year, but rolling annualized standard deviation of the global 60-40. On average, it's right around 9%, 9-10%. This is back through 1995. Um, but as you can see, the, the volatility is all over the place. Sometimes you are way below that estimate and sometimes you are way above that estimate. You know, Andrew, my partner, and I joke around, it's like having your, your uh, feet in the freezer and your head in the oven. It's like on average you're comfortable, or you're you're on average you're you're the right temperature, but you're far from comfortable. Clients clients feel this as well. You know, one of the simple things you can do is actually just essentially rebalance and either tamp down volatility in your portfolio as it rises up beyond a certain limit, and do the opposite. And it actually, you know, even not forecasting anything, but just looking backward. Um, you can actually get much, much closer to your expected level of volatility, and it actually makes your, your distributions of returns much more normal. Um, it, it actually eliminates a lot of the left-hand tails. Those 13 standard deviation events come in by adopting this kind of process. Another way that we look at it is, um, and this is where very, very large pools of money start to think of things like this, and Bridgewater Associates um, it sort of uh, adopts this, this kind of quadrant mentality as well. But there are two primary factors that drive global asset classes, and that is, is economic growth growing or is it declining? So that, that um, x-axis. And what is inflation doing? Is it trending higher or is it trending lower? So if you have rising inflation and rising growth, you have a inflationary boom kind of environment. We actually put ourselves kind of in that area right now. For the past 15 years or so, maybe arguably even longer, we've been in a disinflationary boom. Inflation was lower than expected and often trending lower. Um, but then you also have periods of stagflation like the 1970s where inflation's rising, but growth is either stagnant or going down. And then you have deflationary busts, um, periods like 2008 and 2009. But just knowing sort of where the trends are in inflation and economic growth, and you can use leading indicators, we actually have a, an economic model that you can find on our website 
that um, that tracks a a wide range of leading indicators. I know that the uh, the conference board has their own. We like ours a little better, um, but effectively, it just gives you a, a temperature on the market of hey, look, where are we in the in the realm of you know is is grow is fundamental growth actually getting better or is it getting worse? And what are trends in commodity prices and CPI and PCE? And you can use those to, you know, don't take your foot off the bag, but you can, you know, lean one way or, or the other to help improve your risk profile and your return profile. Also, on a more technical standpoint, momentum. It kind of works everywhere. So I'm going to do my best to explain this, but effectively, the average momentum, if you take the average momentum of these asset classes, so up here, We've got commodities, emerging market stocks, gold, international developed stocks, the S&P 500, and long-term U.S. Treasuries. If you basically calculate the two-month or six-month or 12-month rate of change, basically how, how fast are they going up? And you average them over those, those periods. So the two-month, the six-month, the 12-month, everything in between. And then you rank them. Who had the highest momentum? Who had the lowest momentum? Those at the highest ranks the next month tend to outperform their average performance. And those that are the lowest ranked tend to underperform their average performance. So just by tilting based on these kind of metrics, essentially what's going up, invest in that, pull away from the things that are going down. Just these dynamic capabilities can actually help shift the portfolio and de-risk it. So we actually took that momentum-based process and ran it across the simulated asset data that we did for our Monte Carlos. So took the process and apl applied it to simulated data. And the purple line essentially is where we end up. And what the, the key thing to point out is it's more of a risk management technique than it is anything else. It's tightening up that left-hand tail. It's bringing that in and it's reallocating those outcomes more towards the, the center of the distribution. Um, and this is why we, it looks, it looks kind of like it's going from left to right and it kind of is, um, but, more, but it's more in, in our view a risk management technique than, than a return enhancing technique. And I've got this kind of technicolor piece of the pie chart because it's, it's effectively trading everything else within that, um, the static allocation. It's just adapting in and out as the markets evolve. So, looks like we're doing pretty good on the absolute performance, continue to outperform, continue to decrease risk. So you can see the maximum drawdown number um, comes in quite a bit. Goes from 23% on the downside to around 19. That's that left-hand tail sort of shifting um, more towards the middle, getting more consistency. But still, the thorn in our side is this, this tracking error component. This is, this is better than what we've seen before, um, but still something that we, we can't ignore. And it's a problem that you know, active managers continue to run into. So here, here's the part that I think is might be new to a lot of folks. And it's something that I remember reading about in the CFA materials, which were, uh, you can think of it as, um, I think what the endowments and um, pension plans called it was portable alpha. But it's effectively using more capital efficient means to get access to your core beta exposures. So you can either go by the SPY or you can go by futures on the S&P 500 get the exact same exposure but with a lot less capital deployed. You then take that capital and then you can go do some other things with it. Now, if you go buy more S&P, you're just levering up. But if you go buy things that are uncorrelated, that are structurally different, you start to really harness those diversification benefits and you get to essentially stack the returns on top of each other. Um, now, for the longest time, this has not been available to any retail investor. 
This is always something that large institutions could take advantage of. But the fun part is this is now actually now very much available to, to retail. PIMCO has actually been doing something like this for a long time. Um, and this example, what I'm going to walk you through is PIMCO has a fund they call their Stock Plus Long Duration. It's effectively a 100-100 fund. So if I have $100 and I, go to, and I go to PIMCO and I say, I want $100 of this fund, I'm essentially going to get $100 worth of the S&P and I'm going to get $100 worth of long bond. That's a levered bet. I don't know if I want that. I don't know if I want my clients to have that. But what if I want a 50-50 portfolio? So I've got the $100. Well, I can go and buy $50 worth of SPY and $50 worth of TLT. Or I can go to PIMCO and give them $50. And they give me $50 worth of SPY and $50 worth of TLT. And then I get to have $50 of cash sitting in my pocket. Both of these are effectively equivalent. If the, the blue line here is the $50 allocation into PIMCO, and the orange line is a 50-50 allocation to SPY TLT. Just in the PIMCO example, I get to keep some cash, and I can go do other things with that. I can go buy investment-grade bonds. I can go buy treasuries. I can go buy you know, alternative managers, et cetera. Wisdom Tree is also doing similar things. They have a US 6040, an EM 6040, and uh, an IFA 6040. But it's essentially, it's a 9060. It's a 1.5x on a 6040 portfolio. Just like PIMCO, I can either go to the market and I can say, I'm going to buy $60 of the SPY or $40 and $40 of the TLT. Or I can go buy NTSX which is Wisdom Tree's 9060, but I only want to put $67 in it. I get the exact same exposure. I just have $33 left in my pocket to go do whatever I want with. I threw this graphic together kind of last minute, so I apologize for its simplicity, but effectively what we've been doing here is we've been going from this fairly, in my opinion, fairly fragile, stock bond portfolio, making it more robust, making it more diversified, adding in better risk management, and even tilting into things like factors to enhance our um, you know, intelligence of how we're getting allocated to, to global equities. And then we're kind of juicing it up a little bit. So effectively, take your core beta components, your ACWI and your AG, and use these more capital efficient products to get that exposure, to replicate that exposure, and then take your dry powder and you know, essentially throw it into the other assets, the uncorrelated assets in your portfolio to scale it up. So when we do this, we maintain a fairly tight distribution. Effectively, this is around a 20% geared portfolio. So we're not kind of, we're not, it's not, it's not 5%, but it's not 100. Um, I, I did 20 to kind of show the magnitude of it. Um, but effectively, we're just taking this much more robust, diversified portfolio and scaling it up. And with that, we get, as we expect, a shift of the, uh, of the distribution of expected returns from left to right. And as you'll see, just by the scaling of it, you know, your, your vol goes up. Your sharp ratio basically stays the same, but you, you capture a meaningful amount of additional annualized return. Um, but still with a third less drawdown than the 60-40 and about the same level of volatility. Second part of the dual mandate is here's our tracking error. Here's our outperformance curve. Um, arguably, I could have thrown some red bars on here, but most of the periods where it looks like it slightly underperforms, it's slightly underperforms. It's not that meaningful. It's more, more in terms of parity. So it looks to be a much more consistent form 
of generating a portfolio that's going to beat the passive benchmark. There are a lot of institutions that are deploying this concept of capital efficiency. This is a short list uh, of some of them. Um, you know, we, we actually uh, got this, this table from our friends at Newfound Research. Um, if you haven't, if you don't know who they are, they're very smart guys. I'd, I'd uh, look into to some of their, their work. Um, and they are rolling out a number of products that are more capital efficient. So the final takeaways here are, you know, the one thing I just always want to hammer away at is build better robustness, more reliability, you know, better diversification, better balance. I think that a lot of people have gotten really comfortable in a 60-40, and we've been in, in, in a deflationary boom environment for the past 30 years. Um, and we have a reason to believe that that will not necessarily be the next 30 years. So stocks and bonds have been great two legs of the stool to, to lean on. But if we have continued inflation, if we have any economic growth shocks, we're going to want some, uh, some incremental diverse fires in there. If you're going to seek higher returns, do it through evidence-based methods. Do factor tilts at a minimum. Don't go chasing the most you know, high-flying stock. Don't just load up on NVIDIA. Um, these portfolios, this is all for presentation purposes and an example, but it can be adopted for any risk appetite. You know, one way that is more palatable for a lot of folks is just like the wisdom tree example. It's like, I want a 60, 40, I'm going to go plop $67 in the 60, 40. That's my benchmark. I've locked that in the $33 on the side. Now I'm going to go do some of the differentiated stuff, but that differentiated stuff stacks on top of the 60-40, it's not going to work against it. Um, and you can do this for a 20-80 or an 80-20 or you know, anything in between. So in our war on passive, this is our kind of best solution to date on if you really want to go out there and beat benchmarks and do it in a way that you're not going to get fired, this is generally the, the framework to go with. Um, and the cool thing is, is these are exciting times. So there's a whole boatload of new ETFs and 40 Act funds coming out. A lot of them are high quality al alternatives. We have market neutral managers, trend followers, um, global macro, uh, merger arb, et cetera, even factor funds, lots of factor funds, um, even ones that do a really, really shockingly good job of tracking to the empirical research like what was outlined in um, the you know, the, the Fama French research. There's growing uh, appetite for enhanced capital efficiency. Um, PIMCO's doing it, Wisdom Tree, et cetera. And they're coming out with actually shockingly low uh, expense ratios and investment minimums. If even if they're ETFs, they don't even have an investment minimum, just the, the share price, or there's fractional, I guess. And then we're seeing a lot of these coming out as ETFs, so there's much better tax efficiency. So that's, that's what I got. Hopefully that was informative and hopefully it made sense, but happy to answer any questions. Thomas. You mentioned the inflationary environment that we're in in the 30 years, over the past 30 years, and the correlation between bonds and stocks has, has changed. What, how do you adjust for that? Yeah, so you need to, you need to track the, the structural relationship. And so using stocks and bonds as a counterbalance as of now is arguably you know, not something that you can really lean on. Um, you're really going to want things that are going to fight inflation or fight inflation volatility um, a little bit better. So if we do see a second wave or a third wave of inflation, um, which after the forecast dinner, sounds like that happens more often than not, you're going to want something that's going to stave off or it's going to zig where the other parts are zagging. 
But I mean, good question. You, you want to track those rolling correlations and bake that in to how you're optimizing your positioning. Yeah. For the dynamic positioning part, what are some of the main drivers? I know we kind of talked about this earlier, but like if you're saying we're going to put 15, 20 percent where it's going to sort of function, it, where are some of the drivers you look at for that? So in this example, because we, you know, doing a Monte Carlo using like historical economic data and things like that is very difficult. So we were just like, look, the momentum stuff tends to work and we can actually use a momentum, simple me momentum methodology, kind of like the, the chart that I showed before with the, with the blue bars and the red bars. Yeah, and so really using that kind of methodology and applying that to the simulated um, asset class returns, that's, that's effectively how you're just generating those um, simulations, if you will. Is that, is that answering your question? I think maybe it does. I was, I was thinking about how you allocate that portion as the dynamic positioning, or meaning that it's not 50, 40 percent you know, it, It's not constantly, say, 50 percent, equity, 20 percent, based on more of that personal bucket. Yep. Like, when would you say tilt more in the chicken? Uh, you're saying based on momentum primarily? Within, within that bucket, yes. Yeah. So effectively, the way that this has been run is you take $20 out of your 100 and you put it in that component yeah. and everything else in the pie chart is ignoring what's going on within that bucket. So as those you know, ebb and flow, it's happening within that sort of model account, whereas everything else is you know, um, just long-term static. Yeah. Okay. Just curious, John, I know this is not your territory, but uh, maybe like not correlated strategies that aren't easily adjustable. Things like you know, music royalties, litigation financing, yeah. you know, life settlements, those sort of things. Like, do you, do you, would you find this inherently attractive, or is it kind of see what the data? You know? For yes, so high level answer yes. Um, the the thing you have to be careful of is just. Do they have any structural components that make them go, like, go to correlation of one in times of, you know, crisis? So a good example of this would be, like, merger arbitrage. So merger arb over extended periods of time is effectively zero correlated to traditional assets. Because all you're doing is you're betting on a merger going through and you're long one stock and you're short the other. But in a period like 08-09, all those mergers start to unwind all at the same time, and that's when those bets sort of explode. So the merger ARB funds had a really difficult time during that period when you really wanted them to be uncorrelated um, like they were you know, hopefully going to be but turned out not to be. So when, whenever you're assessing any type of alternative return stream, you really want to kind of roll up your sleeves and be like, okay, what happens in this kind of situation? Does everything stay together or do things fall apart? Anybody else? All right. Thank you all.